Kelly, uh, I appreciate the introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. You're good. Did that, did that work for everybody? Well, uh, again, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. My name is Dan Hani, uh, Director of High Performance HVAC Solutions for Veritech and Company Educator. Uh, and joining, uh, thank you for joining us today on today's presentation of health and well-being, one breath at a time. The presentation was actually built to support our first indoor environmental quality symposium held in November. I was one of the three featured speakers, and I was pleased to say, very pleased and, uh, to have had Dr. Stephanie Taylor and Dr. Mark Arith join us for their presentations for that event. Regardless, there are a lot of pressures developing in the market and in the industry today for reasons I'll go into as to how indoor air quality is becoming a main concern, not only for the federal government and ASHRAE, but I think also for insurance companies, et cetera. And consequently, it's gaining status and gaining momentum in our uh, build environment. So, um, well, let me see here, let me make a quick adjustment. There we go. Uh, again, my name is Dan Hani. I've been in the industry for, uh, gosh, going on 38 years. I started in 1985 uh, and as an estimator for the Norman S. Wright Company. And over the years have moved into engineering sales. And at Veritech, uh, I moved into the educational role and director of high performance HVAC solutions. We have some new visitors joining us today. Uh, I'll be brief because we do have a lot of material to cover today. And the reason why the presentation is dense is so that you will be able to have it as a PDF resource in the future and hopefully have a lot of information at your fingertips uh, um, at a later date when you may want to reference back to the presentation. So uh, I, I uh, uh, that is one of the reasons behind uh, putting so much information and data into these sessions. But who is Veritech? Veritech is a manufacturer's rep organization. Realistically, we are an HVAC system solution provider, and we have a presence from San Diego all the way through to uh, West Texas uh, in our Lubbock office. We can actually assist in looking at HVAC systems for any type of built environment and be a resource for evaluating numerous time, types, if not all types of HVAC systems. Uh, and uh, especially now with a focus on high performance building designs, whether it be displacement ventilation, underfloor air, chill beams, um, we can support in all of those various design concepts. Uh, <clears throat> during the pandemic, we recognize the need for and desire for more information to get out into the industry. So we launched our Veritech Technical Institute. Uh, and uh, the mission of the Institute is to provide an educational platform for continued learning in the HVAC industry with a focus on high performance buildings and innovative technologies for a better built environment. Uh, the upcoming curriculum for this year's Veritech Technical Institute has uh, been uh, pretty much defined. We have various dates for various sessions. And there's method in the way we've structured the development of the sessions throughout 2023. Uh, in order to understand high performance building, to just present on chilled beams or 100% outside air systems or variable refrigerant, uh, I think is um, uh, not what's necessary. I think it's really important that we start from the bare bone fundamentals of what HVAC systems are and how they work, what their role and function is. Look at thermal uh, thermal dynamics and heat transfer, and we really try to look at it from a layperson's standpoint and um, make sure that we have a working understanding of the very simple processes we're trying to achieve. We're then moving into building humidification and then psychrometrics deconstructed where I actually break down the psychrometric chart and rebuild it so that making it more accessible and understanding what it how to use it. We're then moving into the physics of airflow and the importance of ventilation and building design considerations since 100% outside air systems 
are demonstrating to be a very, effect, a very effective bridge for spanning the divide between better IAQ and more efficient buildings, a topic that we'll explore more fully throughout this presentation. Also, people who have joined us in the past may have received Veritech's new newsletter. I think we just launched the February issue yesterday. We realize that uh, our market needs to become aware of the forces driving our industry to reconsider how buildings are designed and consequently how HVAC systems are to be designed. So uh, if you do receive the newsletter, you may want to look at it. We're trying to limit it to four or five topics and links that actually express what national initiatives, whether it be through the federal government or ASHRAE or any other body such as AIA's 2030 commitment, um, making you aware of uh, what's coming into our market, how it might be influencing how buildings are designed. <clears throat> With that said, let's move into today's presentation, health and well-being one breath at a time. Uh, to give you just a general roadmap of where we're going, we're going back in time. We're going back to an earlier group of sessions that I gave in 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, we're going to review the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force Indoor Air Quality Guidelines. We're going to look at the EPA and the CDC White House statements on IAQ and something of the history of the awareness of how we came to understand that infection, uh, COVID infections are actually transmitted as an aerosol within the air of a building or a space. We're then gonna look at air quality, contaminants, and CO2, a topic that is gaining a, a more and more interest within ASHRAE and reevaluation. We're gonna look at the indoor environment, the importance of ventilation at IEQ. We're gonna look at ventilation-related strategies as proposed by ASHRAE and how they might be considered in future designs. Then we're gonna look at a Department of Energy statement regarding how energy efficient, how building efficiency is gonna be increased again per the ASHRAE standard 90.1 2019 guidelines. And then systems, HVAC systems that span the divide between uh, good indoor air quality as well as more energy efficient uh, uh, system designs. So let's begin. <clears throat> ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force. Let's walk back into time. Let's look at indoor air quality guidelines and how and when they occurred and who influenced which decisions when. Remember that when the pandemic uh, became apparent in early 2020, there was ASHRAE you know, on March 30th, 2020, launched their epidemic task force and they also provide HVAC design guidelines uh, on how to devise HVAC systems for schools and universities, healthcare, commercials, laboratory, residential. It was very, very, very good. And in April, on April 14th, 2020, they issued their ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols, a document that I leaned on heavily to demonstrate uh, how to apply the document in evaluating which heating and ventilating solutions can reduce the risk of infections within a building. The uh, epidemic task force uh, 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 also uh, went on to provide guidelines on ventilation and filtration and uh, stating that uh, ventilation, that filtration and heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems can reduce the airborne concentration of SARS-CoV-2 and thus reduce the risk of infection through the air. So ASHRAE was saying this back in April of 2020. Uh, ASHRAE standard 62.1 2019 uh, went on to say that um, uh, ventilation is an important factor to be considered for reducing the risk of infection. Uh, ventilation is defined as the process of supplying air to or removing air from a space for the purpose of controlling air contaminant levels, humidity, temperature within spaces, et cetera. And please be understand, though I've seen it misapplied, that ventilation air in a room is not necessarily only the outside air. It comp it's comprised of conditioned, filtered return air and outside air. It's a mixed air condition in most circumstances. The ASHRAE position document on infectious aerosols goes on to state that some diseases, diseases 
are known to spread by infectious aerosols. The risk of pathogen spread can be infected by both positively and negatively by the airflow patterns in a space and by heating and ventilating an air conditioning system. So how air is delivered into a space can impact the rate of infection. It goes on to state that there are ventilation related strategies to reduce the risk of infection. Not only is there dilution, there are also airflow patterns, uh, pressurization, humidity distribution and control, ultra, ultraviolet light germicidal irradiation. These are topics I'll be covering in today's presentation. Um, so uh, that's the reason why they're highlighted in red. So let's go back in history to the EPA and the CDC and current White House initiatives and their statements on indoor air quality. Back in August 25th, an article was published in Time Magazine, August 25th of 2020, I'm sorry, by a Jose Luis Jimenez. Um, he was professor of chemistry uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. COVID-19 is transmitted through aerosols. We have now, we have enough evidence. Now it is time to act. Contrary to public health messaging, I, together with many other scientists, believe that a substantial share of COVID-19 cases are the result of transmission through aerosols. Well, this was important because until this uh, uh, Time article was released and this paper was written, it was common understanding that COVID-19 were spread predominantly by fomites and large droplets within the six foot safe distancing guidelines. The WHO and uh, CDC promoted this understanding, but Dr. Jimenez stated publicly in August, uh, in August of 2020, I believe this is a significant mistake. And on July 6th, I along with 239 scientists appealed to the World Health Organization to reevaluate their stance who updated their position in response, but the agency's language continues to express skepticism of the importance of this pathway. <clears throat> well, in October of 2020, the CDC changed its mind. It did recognize that aerosolized transmission of COVID-19 was a means of transmission, and it began adding it into their language to the extent that in a New York Times magazine on May 7th of 2021, the CDC adjusted their language to say the virus is an airborne threat and the CDC acknowledges it. That SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by exposure to infectious respiratory fluids. So uh, that's a, that's a, that was a major development at that time to demonstrate that really anywhere within the built environment where somebody is infected, there is the risk of transmission beyond the six foot social distancing guidelines. The CDC also posted on May 7th, uh, the following statement, inhalation of the virus in the air farther than six feet from an infectious source can occur. And it went on to say that enclosed spaces with inadequate ventilation can result in increased risk of infection because of the very fine droplets released by infected agents, those droplets are light enough to be buoyant and float within the cubic volume of space. The Environmental Protection Agency came out and said about this same period that the spread of COVID-19 does occur via airborne particles. And these droplets that are expressed by any infected person, either through coughing, sneezing, and perhaps even more importantly, tidal breathing, can result in aerosolized pathogens uh, that would increase the risk of infection. The White House on October 11th issued its Clean Air in Buildings Challenge, and it held on October 10th its first indoor air quality summit. The White House is now working with ASHRAE in order to reduce the risk of infection from COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. They are working with ASHRAE and how to, uh, uh, what type of standards need to be written 
to reduce the risk of infection and to create a cleaner, healthier built environment for occupants. The challenge the White House launched, the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge, uh, is, was actually brought about to inspire building owners to uh, uh, take into consideration of the quality and cleanliness of the air breathed within the space. And there's a reason for that. 90% of most people's lives are spent indoors. So better indoor air quality is a powerful tool in preventing the spread of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, but also to reduce the, uh, the other impacts of uh, contaminants in the air and how they impact one's personal health. One of the ways that uh, building owners can help increase the indoor air quality of a building is by optimizing fresh air ventilation. Bring clean outdoor air indoors and circulate it throughout the space to dilute contaminants that otherwise build up in the space. So the lessons learned. The lessons learned brought about by the pandemic show that uh, ASHRAE was ahead of the curve in understanding how uh, SARS-CoV-2 was transmitted and that it took the CDC and the World Health Organization to uh, uh, several months to catch up to what ASHRAE was promoting. And consequently, I've leaned heavily on ASHRAE in these presentations and uh, giving us a pathway forward on how to create better IAQ and to reduce the risk of infection. So <clears throat> let's explore air quality, contaminants, and carbon dioxide. Again, just a quick review. We acknowledge that the, C or the CDC acknowledges that SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by exposure to infectious respiratory fluids or droplets ex uh, uh, exhaled or ejected by an infected occupant. The CDC website came out with a subsequent statement that one of the ways to reduce the risk of infection is through ventilation mitigation strategies. And it goes on to say, eliminate or reduce HVAC air recirculation, which is a very bold statement to have made back in 2021. The EPA is also advocating for optimizing fresh air into a building to create clean, uh, to create a, 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 a clean environment within the space. You bring in outside air into a building, you actually mix it properly within the, with the air inside the building, and you will reduce the concentration of contaminants that will otherwise be ingested. So very often we're for, uh, we pose this question, well, that's good, but what if the building you own is in downtown Phoenix, downtown LA? Certainly the air quality outdoors is perhaps worse than the indoors. Well, that is not true. Uh, remember that if a building is getting the outside air requirements required by building codes and standards, that not only do you have contaminants off-gassed by internal surfaces within a building, such as carpeting, paint, occupants, etc. You also have the same contaminants outdoors being brought indoors. So um, it's, it's a myth to think that maybe the indoor air quality is cleaner than outdoors, perhaps even in some of our most polluted cities. Now, don't get me wrong, if you're living near a manufacturer's center that is pumping formaldehyde into the outdoor air, that could present a problem in itself. But we're speaking in generalities here and as a general rule. In fact, the EPA supports that by stating uh, that indoor levels of pollutants may be two to five times and occasionally more than 100 times higher than outdoor levels. So that's an important consideration. Again, increase the ventilation, increase the amount of outdoor air into your building to help reduce the risk of infection. There's also another development occurring within the industry, and that is a re-evaluation of CO2 concentrations. How does carbon dioxide impact human physiology, cognition, performance, etc.? Well, CO2 is a stoichiometric byproduct of both hydrocarbon fuel combustion and biological metabolism. Measuring CO2 concentration offers an easy way to gauge the concentration of other pollutants. The higher the CO2 concentration, 
chances are the higher the con other contaminant concentrations are in the space. And this is per a very inter interesting article that was published in June of 2022 by the ASHRAE Journal, written by Robert Stum. The article of Mr. Stum goes on to suggest that here are that there is some statistical correlation that may exist between the concentration of CO2 and the aggregate of other byproduct pollutants affecting human comfort and wellness. Well, let's look at Phoenix, Arizona. There was a, res a research gate did a study of outdoor air CO2 concentrations in 2013. And they uh, found that there's an urban CO2 dome that reaches 555 parts per million uh, in the center of Phoenix. In the outlying regions, it decreases to about 370 parts per million at the outskirts. Well, in uh, 1999, ASHRAE standard 62.1 offered this limit to CO2 concentrations in the build environment. It said that providing the built environment can maintain a CO2 concentration of 700 parts per million above the outdoor air CO2 levels, then um, uh, that should be good enough to go. And that has been grandfathered into approximately about 1,000 parts per million CO2 based on outdoor CO2 levels back in the mid 80s of about 350 to 370 parts per million. However, our CO2 concentrations are increasing. Urban Phoenix is now measuring in the realm of 555 parts per million. So if you use 62.1's guideline and add 700 to that value, you're now at 1,255 parts per million of indoor CO2. <clears throat> uh, in July of 2020, News 12 published a, uh, an article that showed that measured CO2 levels in, uh, at that time were reading at about 575 parts per million. So, uh, and it goes on to say that that's a 291% increase from 1990. So CO2 levels in Phoenix are increasing and consequently Robert Stubbs article that uh, the challenges whether or not using 1,000 parts per million is a good guideline because uh, we're actually increasing our indoor CO2 levels above and beyond 1,000 parts per million to ever greater levels of 12, 1,300, and 1,400 parts per million. So CO2 is being reevaluated uh, seriously, and it is now being uh, proposed that maybe CO2 concentrations in the build environment should more closely approximate six to 800 parts per million. And the only way you can do that, to my understanding, is to bring in more outside air to actually uh, uh, reduce the level of CO2 building up with inside a building. So the indoor environment, what is the importance of ventilation and the importance of indoor air quality? So per the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, uh, it was very apparent, and ASHRAE has argued for uh, a long time, there is no one single method to reduce the, uh, the risk of infection in a building and to provide better indoor air quality. Consequently, the epidemic task force reached uh, leaned on the modality they set up for hospitals, and that is to use a multiple modality approach. In other words, use two or three various solutions to help create a healthier indoor environment. Uh, and uh, ASHRAE Standard 170, which writes the healthcare standards, actually defines that in a couple of ways by increasing building humidity, increasing air change rates in rooms, increased ventilation rates, etc. So <clears throat> how do we create environments that result in what came to be known in the 80s and 90s as sick building syndrome. Well, how did sick building syndrome occur? Well, first of all, sick building sy syndrome is used to describe situations in which building occupants experience acute health and comfort effects that appear to be linked to time spent in a building. 
causes of the sick building syndrome was the result of the 1973 oil embargo when outside air brought into the building was reduced to 5 CFM per occupant. <clears throat> Inadequate ventilation, however, it was discovered, may all, uh, uh, cause through uh, heating and ventilating and air, uh, air conditioning systems do not effectively distribute air to people in a building is thought to be an important factor of SBS or sick building syndrome. So not having adequate ventilation, not having adequate outside air into a building. And at those levels, the CFM uh, within a, of outside air provided to a building was based on a level of five CFM per occupant. So <clears throat> taking that into account, and uh, the cause of sick building, uh, that reduced ventilation was the cause of sick building syndrome. In 1991, ASHRAE elevated the outside air CFM levels to 20 CFM, 15 CFM, depending on the type of use of, of a building. ASHRAE standard 62.1 2016, however, again, reduced the outside air levels. Why? Well, because of the movement toward uh, increased building efficiency to handle the carbon issue that we're facing globally in the world today. Reduce the amount of outside air to make HVAC systems more efficient. The less outside air you have to condition, the more efficient your system. So air flows were reduced back to 5 CFM per person and 10 CFM per person. Well, <clears throat> Uh, this has uh, 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 become a factor, perhaps, on how building environments are, uh, can offer a higher or increased risk of infection, because the current standard and guidelines are now back to older standards, and it begs the question whether or not uh, we're getting adequate outside air to reduce the risk of infection and to create a healthier environment. So <clears throat> that being said, when we design an HVAC system, more often than not, these systems are designed to provide minimum ventilation rates prescribed by the standard, not ideal rates, minimal rates. And consequently, if you design to the minimum and you have a building that's been up in operation for a while, and a building owner should ask the question, are package rooftop DX unit outside air dampers set to allow at least the minimum amount of outdoor in a building to reduce the risk of infection? That was one of the prescriptive measures the epidemic task force uh, advocated for, is to make sure the outside air damper is properly set on those mixed air units. Our variable air volume systems, VAV systems, modulating, outdoor air dampers to open to maintain outside air mass flow rates at part load conditions. When you're in your fall, winter, or spring loads, our loads decrease. Consequently, VAV boxes throttle back. So if you're to maintain the proper outside air within the occupied spaces, you have to increase the outside air percentage to the air provided to those spaces. The only way you can do that is the outside air damper serving an air handler must modulate open at part load conditions to maintain outside air levels. So the question is, are those modulating outside air dampers working appropriately? Well, <clears throat> when are buildings at part load conditions? Fall, winter, and early spring. And that's where we need to ask ourselves whether or not our institutional buildings or larger commercial buildings that have variable air volume systems are actually providing the outside air minimum rates uh, uh, prescribed by ASHRAE 62.1. So let's look at various uh, ventilation related strategies for the indoor environment. What strategies can be applied to improve IAQ and reduce the risk of infection? Again, going back, let's look at ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force, and that's ventilation-related strategies. We're going to look at dilution. We're going to look at airflow patterns. We're going to look at humidity distribution and control. And then we're going to look at ultraviolet light germicidal radiation. And again, it's going to be a general flyover on these. I have presentations built, one-hour presentations built 
on each of these sessions independently that we can provide at a future time. I'm also going to touch on an emerging technology acknowledged by ASHRAE of uh, passive ionization. So let's look at ventilation strategy dilution. Let's look at dilution and the well mixed environment. So <clears throat> To reduce concentration of aerosolized pathogens and other contaminants released into a space, to reduce those contaminants, we need to make sure that the room air is stirred up and agitated so the contaminants are well mixed. We don't have pockets of high density or high concentrations of contaminants or infection that uh, make a less healthy environment for the occupants. Well, how do we create a mixed air environment? Acknowledged by ASHRAE, air handlers supply air at a maximum flow rate during our peak summer design conditions. The HVAC system is designed to meet that air flow rate. Diffusers are selected for max flow and a discharge velocity of about 150 feet per minute. By injecting air at high velocity, room air is induced into the supply air jet supply your jet that results in mixing and hopefully uniform temperature throughout the cubic volume of space. <clears throat> well, when do we see, again, peak airflow at diffusers? Well, that's at our peak summer design condition. In Phoenix, Arizona, it's our summer months. In June, when it's 115, maybe even now 120 outdoors, our actual peak summer design condition is monsoon, when we have a lot of moisture and humidity in the air. However, um, we have to ask the question that when we do inject air per conventional wisdom at high velocity, is uniform mixing actually occurring in the environment? Well, uh, GLHN architects, who I've called on for a number of years, uh, uh, presented me with a study that they did with CFD modeling that demonstrated that a well mixed condition may not occur at peak airflow in environments depending on the location of occupants in the space, the geometry of the furniture, and various other factors as well. And their CFD model demonstrated that vortices occur within the space in which you uh, uh, contaminants and pathogen pathogens can begin to accumulate into higher concentrations, making them a higher risk area for infection. Dr. Kishore Kankari uh, wrote in July of 2021 for the ASHRAE Journal a wonderful article. It's called The Analysis of Spread of Airborne Contaminants and Risk of Infection. Dr. Kankari goes on to write that good ventilation is commonly referred to as an increased supply of clean air or increased air change rates per hour for enclosed spaces. However, he goes on to say that simply increasing the supply of clean air may not be sufficient to achieve good ventilation. Dr. Kankari goes on to say in a real situation, the spatial and temporal variations of airflow patterns in a space can result in a non-uniform airflow distribution, which in turn can yield a non-uniform distribution of infection probability. Dr. Kankari goes on to write, in spite of mixing airflow patterns, the contaminant distribution is not uniform and does not create well-mixed conditions. So he went on to advocate and study in his CFD analysis how locating supply diffusers and return air registers in a space can help to reduce the risk of infection. By increasing the number of diffusers, by increasing the number of return grills, and, a prop, and appropriately locating them in relation to each other, you can reduce the risk of infection, his modeling suggests by greater than 15%. Than, than, uh, uh, Dr. Kankari's conclusions are, create a distributed supply layout for increasing the number of supply diffusers and strategically placing them over the occupied zone. He goes on to state that create a distributed return layout by increasing the number of exhaust outlets 
to create a path of least resistance for contaminated air to exit the space. So um, uh, how air, air devices are located within a building or within a room or within a zone can actually help reduce the risk of infection. The problem, however, is, is that if you're in a building served by a variable air volume system where VAV boxes modulate open and close to maintain room temperature set points, then when you're at part load conditions, fall, winter, or spring, those VAV boxes throttle down, reducing the amount of airflow. You reduce the amount of airflow at a diffuser, you reduce the amount of mixing in the space. And uh, I don't think it's any accident at all that there's uh, a, the coincidence of uh, our part load seasons and cold and flu season, because our fall, winter, and spring is not only our low load uh, uh, design day where we have reduced airflow rates to rooms, but it's also our driest time of year. Consequently, we have very low humidity levels in our buildings. So what are the advantages of looking at the air distribution layout? Well, CFD modeling shows more effective exhaust of room air through more return grills and locations, a method for enhancing room air dilution by properly placing diffusers within a space. It's a good retrofit solution for reducing the risk of infection in existing buildings and potentially the lowest first cost solution. The disadvantages of air distribution layout are the effectiveness of contaminant removal and validation thereof, especially at part load conditions, and it really doesn't offer energy efficient, and it does not offer an energy efficiency advantage. There's another way of looking at air patterns, and that's using a technology called low pressure VAV diffusers. Instead of modulating airflow to a group of zones from a VAV box to maintain space set point temperature at the thermostat, these diffusers are their own actuating device, increasing and decreasing the free area at the diffuser, allowing more or less airflow to leave the diffuser to maintain space set point condition. By restricting the airflow at low flow and creating high velocity discharge at low flow, these diffusers can maintain proper mixing in an environment, uh, even at low load conditions. And it should be considered that if you, uh, if an owner wants to uh, create a healthier environment, this might be an excellent, relatively inexpensive way to do that uh, and moving away from the VAV box solution because these diffusers respond to the load local to each diffuser, local to each room, and maintain the discharge velocities through diffusers to encourage proper mixing in the space. The advantages of low pressure VAV diffusers, well, they're a more effective, uh, they're a more effective dilution option for room air, especially at part load condition. They're low pressure variable volume systems, so energy efficiency to a building can be increased 20 to 25%. They have a mechanically controlled solution for ease of control, management, and very low maintenance, uh, and an opportunity for low first cost uh, mechanical operation and reduced maintenance of these systems because they are mechanical uh, uh, devices and do not need digital DDC control technologies. The disadvantages are that their low pressure VAC systems will require larger ductwork in a new building and uh, also, it doesn't offer a solution for validating the amount of outside air reaching each zone. Another display, uh, dis, uh, air distribution uh, 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 methodology that is being looked at seriously by ASHRAE, and it's being looked at very closely. In fact, it was supported by the White House's uh, IAQ summit, and, look, uh, and it's advocating for a more serious look at underfloor air systems and it's called displacement ventilation. Unlike mixed air systems that create uniform temperature within an environment by injecting air at high velocity through diffusers, this technology actually brings warmer air at very low velocities lower to the zone, creating a thermally stratified environment. 
roughly 70 degrees at the floor, 75 degrees at a thermostat, 80 to 85 degrees in the upper levels of the room, where uh, depending on the ceiling height and the amount of load in that room. You put the return air grills in the ceiling or upper levels of the wall, and the contaminated room air build up in that upper level of the room is exhausted from the space. So <clears throat> what actually moves air when a room that is thermally stratified resulting from displacement ventilation? Well, any heat source in the space moves air via convection. So these systems are very efficient and also offer better indoor air quality as acknowledged by ASHRAE standard 62.1. Um, one of the, the ideal way to handle displacement ventilation and to create a thermally stratified environment is to look at underfloor air systems where the air is actually supplied through the floor plenum itself. Because in this design, you have diffusers located throughout the floor of a space and a single piston of clean conditioned air is drawn up across an occupant's breathing zone to the upper levels of the room where it's exhausted from the space. So displacement ventilation uh, is, is very attractive. And I've got a video here, hopefully it all starts up, that should demonstrate how a heat source moves air in the space, not high velocity discharge air that otherwise requires fan energy to bring that air at high velocity. In this video, actually taken by our manufacturer of displacement ventilation products, Kruger, they demonstrate how a heat source at the opposite end of the room draws smoke-filled air release, released from displacement diffusers to its location because of the convective plume, and that convective plume is drawing room air to it and you'll soon see the smoke of the supply air rising off the heat source to the upper level of the room. Well, the convective plume of a, a human occupant, hopefully with a body temperature of 98 degrees, is roughly 30 feet per minute. 30 feet per minute of air continually moving upward, drawing clean conditioned air across the breathing zone. Consequently, <clears throat> displacement ventilation offers better improved indoor air quality, and ASHRAE standard 62.1 assigns displacement ventilation a 1.2 ventilation effectiveness rating, which allows buildings using this design to design to 20% less outside air. However, that has to be weighed against whether or not an owner would like to increase ventilation to reduce the risk of infection in a space uh, that would be a topic for discussion between the building owner and the design teams and something to be considered. So the advantages of there are two types of uh, displacement ventilation solutions. There's a low in wall solution. Uh, these systems are a little more expensive um, because sheet metal needs to be brought down to each diffuser inlet in the wall. Uh, these systems allow for a single pass of clean Conditioned air across the breathing zone offer 1.2 zone distribution effectiveness rating. They uh, provide space airflow is the same during peak and part load conditions, so you don't adjust those flow rates. Uh, low pressure system designed for energy efficiency. In Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona, we can double economizer hours by injecting higher temperature supply air into a space other than 55 degree air we see in conventional systems. They're very adaptive to architectural designs, very quiet in performance, and provide better thermal comfort. The advantages of an underfloor displacement design are uh, <clears throat> the same as the low and wall design, except they are more competitively priced than low and wall solutions. They offer a more effective piston of clean air being drawn from the floor up across breathing zones. Uh, we can provide 100% outside air uh, UFAD systems, uh, which is a very compelling design strategy. And uh, UFAD systems radically reduce the amount of ductwork in a building, uh, something that architectural design teams can find very attractive. The disadvantages of displacement low and wall designs are higher first cost, 
deeper interior walls to hold the actual deeper uh, diffusers that are used and a maximum of 30 feet distance is required between each displacement diffuser. Disadvantages of underfloor air is that uh, early design guidelines for underfloor air systems uh, were uh, offered less than ideal performance. There were some very compromised buildings with the first uh, edition of ASHRAE's underfloor air design guideline. It was pulled from the shelf in 2012 ASHRAE came out with a revised design guideline in 2015, and I must confess that with the underfloor air systems I've been involved with since then, we have not had the challenges that were experienced with earlier designs. They may cost more, more money as a first cost for conventional HVAC solutions such as medium pressure VAV, and uh, building subtrades need to reconsider the fact that if they put in an underfloor air system, they are very much an important part in making sure that the underfloor plenum is sealed and maintains its integrity. <clears throat> so let's look at the indoor environment and humidity control. Why is humidity important for reducing the risk of infection and for maintaining human health? Well, <clears throat> ASHRAE uh, and related humidification studies have determined the role of humidity in reducing the risk of airborne transmission. Excuse me. During the pandemic, <clears throat> all the studies that had been done for the last 30 plus years came forward that showed that properly humidified spaces will reduce the risk of infection. And part of the uh, uh, part of why that is, is because a properly humidified environment will optimize the performance of the human immune system uh, and will also reduce the rate of evaporation of virally loaded droplets expelled by somebody who is sick uh, into a space, allowing for the release of active pathogens into the air at smaller sizes where they become more buoyant. <clears throat> Many studies have been done by ASHRAE and other organizations to demonstrate that properly humidified environments reduce the risk of infection. The Taylor and Tazi study of 2018 suggests that controlling RH reduces the transmission of certain airborne infectious organisms. The position document encourages designers to give careful consideration to temperature and relative humidity. The Musavi study goes on to say that there is an unfavorable survival rate of microorganisms when relative humidity is between 40 to 60 percent. The Taylor and Tazi study went on to show that RH below 40 percent is associated with three factors of increased infection. Infectious aerosols emitted from a primary host shrink rapidly to become droplet nuclei that are more buoyant and will float in the air for longer periods of time. Many viruses and bacteria are anhydrous resistant, which mean that they thrive in dry environments versus moist environments. And relative humidity below 40% impairs mucous membrane barriers in immune system protection, uh, preventing a free flow of mucus from the lungs that usually carry contaminants ingested by an occupant to out of the body. Dr. Stephanie Taylor uh, writes regularly for ES Magazine and is an advocate for properly maintaining building humidity levels to uh, improve human health. Uh, and she goes on to say that there is now overwhelming scientific evidence that a mid-range air humidity has significant benefits for human health. Well, when is Arizona's driest time of the year? Fall, winter, and spring. Well, <clears throat> what does that have to do with SARS-CoV-2 SARS uh, uh, SARS uh, pathogen release and droplet sizes? Please remember that SARS-CoV-2 is approximately 0.125 microns in size. So <clears throat> whenever somebody is sick and they cough or sneeze or breathe in a space, they release droplets of uh, small droplets of mucus and saliva mixtures that are laden with virus. 
as those as those droplets are expressed from an infected agent, they evaporate within seconds, very, very quickly. An evaporating droplet is uh, maintains its buoyancy and is not drawn by gravity to the ground, so they stay in the air longer, allowing them to be present to any other uninfected occupant for ingestion. Uh, and not to mention that when you have properly humidified environments, the mucous membranes within our lungs, the wet surfaces of our nose, etc., uh, uh, are more effective in ejecting uh, 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 mucus from our body that uh, uh, obviously that we want to express and expel out of our body to reduce the risk of infection, as well as if you maintain uh, a wet, larger wet droplets in the air, and somebody does breathe those wet droplets in, those droplets uh, will actually adhere to the wet surfaces of the mouth and of the nose more readily and prevent the uh, deep, uh, 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 the deep ingestion of viruses, of, of desiccated viruses, dry viruses into our lungs where they pose a graver health risk. So the advantages of humidity control in a building, they provide an excellent retrofit solution. Uh, they reduce the aerosolization rate of pathogens. Uh, they are conducive to more effective immune system behavior. Uh, properly humidified environments reduce the active lifespan of pathogens and is a solution for creating more risk-free environments by ASHRAE. The disadvantages are cost of installation and piping, the maintenance program to keep humidification systems in operation, RO water is required, and uh, also we have to make sure that building dew points are tightly are, 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 are controlled adequately to prevent condensation from occurring. Ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. ASHRAE recognizes UVGI as an effective means for deactivating, neutralizing active pathogens in an environment. Ultraviolet energy inactivates viral, bacterial, and fungal organisms, so they are unable to replicate and potentially cause disease. Uh, many studies demonstrate that. ASHRAE has been advocating it for decades, and it's a tried and proven technology. It actually uses the uh, electromagnetic spectrum as the uh, 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 as its method for neutralizing pathogens in the space, uh, and it also can be used as a heat source or cooling source in a building by creating an imbalance of surface temperatures in a room. So it is a solution as well that can be used. Um, the UVC ray, uh, 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 bandwidth that is actually used is the UVC short live wa light wave, and it is actually uh, occupies between 280 and 200 nanometers of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's a very narrow band. Using uh, ultraviolet A, B, and uh, vacuum UV light can present a health hazard, but you can actually control the output of UVC light through these devices very effectively, and that is the uh, actual band uh, uh, bandwidth on the electromagnetic spectrum that should be applied. When pathogens are presented into the environment of ultraviolet light, the uh, nucleic acids, the RNA and DNA molecules are decoupled, uh, causing those pathogens to become inert. They cannot breed. And if they cannot breed and populate and multiply, they cease to be a health hazard. These devices can be placed uh, at cooling coils, uh, at the discharge side of a cooling coil normally, though they can also be put on upstream of a cooling coil. We like to put them downstream uh, because they can more effectively kill any bio growth that might grow due to the condensing coil in the vicinity of the coil in the drain pans. So it's very effective. Air handlers have to be designed to allow enough air travel uh, within the air handler and exposure of the air to the UV lights for it to be effective. And that would be coordinated 
with the manufacturers rep laying out the air handlers in the UV light products. These uh, uh, UV light can also be used on an in the on the fly application that is to say mounted in ductwork. Uh, we have to be cautious of the actual velocity of the air across the coils. The UV light coils would have to be designed appropriately to be effective in this application, but they can be uh, uh, effectively introduced into return air systems uh, or in supply air systems to make sure uh, you have adequate proper pathogen mitigation into a space. They can also be located in upper levels of rooms in the building environments and maybe conference rooms, upper, uh, emergency rooms, etc. Uh, they are located above the exposure to any occupants in the space. Uh, being exposed to UV light is a health concern, but the way these units are devised and, and built, that should not be a, con uh, a concern. So uh, anyway, it is a technology to be uh, uh, considered, uh, certainly for strategic places in, in, in zone, building zones and areas that uh, could be subjective to higher levels of, uh, of infection. So the advantages of ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, is there an excellent retrofit solution that can be put into conference rooms emergency rooms, they can be mounted in supply air ducts, they can be mounted in air handler coils to reduce, to prevent the crossover of any pathogens released in a space that are drawn into a return air grill. Uh, they can actually uh, 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 increase, the, uh, there's no increase to a system static pressure that heightened filtration otherwise does, causing an energy burden. They are recognized by ASHRAE, and there was during the pandemic rebates being offered by this technology with certain uh, uh, utility companies. The disadvantages of UV light are they require a direct line of sight for effectiveness. UV lamps need to be replaced once a year, so there's a maintenance cost associated with them. Occupant UV exposure needs to be uh, considered and uh, proper notices put on air handlers using the technology to make sure that those lights are disabled when uh, a, a service tech is opening an air handler door, etc. And uh, there's, well, when I recognize, when I first wrote this um, a, a, a year ago, there was no conclusive testing that UV light was effective in mitigating SARS-CoV-2. However, it has, there is demonstrated testing to show that it is effective against SARS-CoV-1. Another emerging technology recognized by ASHRAE is needlepoint bipolar ionization. Um, needlepoint bi bipolar ionization works by providing a high voltage charge to what are called ion emitters. Uh, these emitters actually ionize the molecules local to those emitters with positive and negative charges. And by the process of passive ionization, positively and negatively charged particles of contaminants and even uh, pathogens potentially uh, have a tendency to attract, agglomerize, become heavier and uh, fall out of the air or are more effectively captured by filtration systems. So by the process of agglomeration through the use of ionization, uh, uh, this technology suggests that we can actually create a healthier environment and reduce the risk of infection through the process of agglomeration. Uh, the CDC has acknowledged uh, bipolar ionization as an emerging technology. It does make the statement regarding uh, uh, some ion generators are ozone generators. Uh, bipol needlepoint bipolar ionization is not an ozone generator and conforms to UL standard 2998 uh, as a non-ozone generator. So because you use ionization does not mean that you're going to have added levels of ozone in the building depending on which type of generator is uh, used for the design. So the advantages of needlepoint bipolar ionization are they're an excellent cost-effective retrofit solution. There's no increase in system static pressure. 
um, it maintains effectiveness in occupied spaces and beyond, effectively tested for SARS-CoV-2, and is a scalable solution. We can actually put an ion generator into a variable, re variable refrigerant air handler to inject ions most effectively into the space. The disadvantages are that ASHRAE and CDC recognizes ionization as an emerging technology and does not give its full support behind it as it does other ventilation strategies ASHRAE outlines in the Epidemic Task Force. So <clears throat> we've talked about um, various aspects of indoor air quality. What are the factors to be taken into consideration for uh, 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 what defines indoor air quality, contaminants, pathogens. We've looked at ASHRAE task, uh, ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force guidelines and recommendations for reducing the risk of infection in a space and to create healthier environments. However, most of these systems do have an energy penalty associated with them, but not necessarily if a design team has an integrated system of uh, solution approach. First of all, there's another pressure developing that we're all aware of in our market, and that's called energy efficiency, decarbonization. <clears throat> uh, the ASHRAE Journal in September of 2021 made the announcement that the uh, U.S. Department of Energy has issued the determination that standard 90.1-2019 will be the energy performance benchmark for all future buildings. And it also states that municipalities have up to two years to begin to incorporate this language. Well, that is a big jump, and it's going to challenge certainly mechanical teams, mechanical design teams, and how they do conventional HVAC to meet the standard 90.1 guidelines of 2019. Again, to review, ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force recommends dilution, airflow patterns, humidity distribution and control, and ultraviolet light germicidal irradiation as solutions for creating better IAQ and reducing the risk of infection. So is there an opportunity to bridge the divide, to create a building and an HVAC system that will offer both solutions? Well, that was what motivated my July 2022 article for uh, Engineered Systems Magazine. And uh, when, I, uh, went, uh, when I evaluated how 100% outside air variable refrigerant systems could be a good hybrid solution for creating better IAQ by guaranteeing the appropriate volume of outdoor air is brought to each building zone, each room, as well as effectively distributing the refrigerant flow to each space to respond to each zone's load. The study uh, was comprised of three variable refrigerant design configurations. We see it regularly here in Phoenix, Arizona, where variable refrigerant technology uses an untempered uh, outside air source for the outside air to a building. That is to say, we just bring outside air into the air handlers of a variable refrigerant system to mix with the return air drawn by the unit. Uh, then we did two studies uh, of uh, a parallel 100% outside air system where the outside air unit and duct is decoupled from the variable refrigerant system and we did it at two supply air conditions off the dedicated outside air unit, one providing an air at a dew point 53.3 degrees, and the second at providing a lower drier air condition of 48.8 degrees dew point. And the energy efficiency uh, uh, became quite apparent, how low dew point, 100% outside air, variable refrigerant systems offered the greatest operational savings while providing the proper amount of outside air to each zone or more if an owner prefers to have more outdoor air to create even healthier environments. <clears throat> On, uh, uh, in December, uh, I evaluated another system, a 100% outside air passive radiant cooling and heating system. This is where the sensible load of a building is actually drawn to a chill water loop local to each zone, and we bring only 100% outside air to a space. 
These systems are historically seeing 30 to 40 percent energy savings over and above medium pressure VAV systems, and I've had that validated by some of our leading design teams uh, here in Phoenix, uh, not only for Arizona, but also in more humid climates such as Atlanta, Georgia. So this is an excellent solution as well for heightening energy efficiency and in helping to create healthier environments by supplying the appropriate amount of outdoor air to each zone. Uh, if you want to read up on this, I've got another article published in the December 2022 edition of the Engineered Systems Magazine on 100% outside air, passive radiant cooling and heating systems. Uh, Co-authored that article with Darren Alexander, who's principal of TWA Panel Systems, our manufacturer for radiant cooling and heating products. Another solution, what about underfloor air systems using active chill beam technology? that is available today where we can put an active chill beam at perimeter zones and an underfloor air systems uh, to, more, uh, to add another layer of energy efficiency to that type of system. And then we can also do low pressure variable air volume systems and we can even use variable refrigerant systems for underfloor air uh, uh, solutions as well. So uh, we've been involved in a couple of projects uh, that uh, use this rather effective combination. So uh, with that being said, the multiple pressures in the industry to create better indoor air quality, to reduce the risk of infection is growing. That There's momentum growing for that. There's growing public awareness of how the indoor environment does in, impact human health, uh, not only during pandemic, but also outside of pandemic. Uh, but there are also significant pressures for increasing building efficiency. And what might appear to conflict with each other do not, th these two goals do not necessarily need to conflict with each other. They can actually be done uh, uh, effectively with a reconsidered uh, approach to HVAC design for bringing healthier, cleaner air more efficiently into a building. Are there any questions? We do have some questions in the chat. So uh, the first one is about the CDC and the White House, uh, what they're addressing in their, um, their initiative. It, are they reviewing anything about wearing masks in building environments or is it just about the air quality itself? Do you know? Uh, it's predominantly air quality from the papers that I've read. That there are too. studies that have been done, and there was an article printed in 2021 in the ASHRAE journal that demonstrated the effectiveness of how of wearing masks and reducing the risk of infection. Um, I, the name of the article escapes me, but it was a factor of four times greater uh, of reducing the risk of infection by people wearing normal uh, masks that we would buy. Um, we didn't have to go to the um, special high efficiency masks that uh, are out there. What are their N95 masks? Um, and it did demonstrate, there are studies out there that definitely demonstrated that wearing masks reduce the risk of infection. But the uh, uh, in relation to uh, 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 the CDC, uh, I haven't visited their sites in the last two to three months. Uh, they used to advocate, of course, for wearing masks during pandemic. Uh, do they still do so? I, I don't know, but I wouldn't know why they would change. Right, and then with all the discussion of the distance separation and, and um, it changing between six feet to three feet, are they evaluating the actual distance for separation as a guideline? Do you know if they're still talking about separation distance? Uh, no, not, not to my knowledge. Um, they always, it, it is advocated, social distance uh, guidelines of six foot uh, have been, uh, are advocated to reduce the transmission of large droplet, heavily virally loaded droplet transmission by people who are being, who are close to each other as well as the concentration of pathogens available within the small area of space separating between the two individuals. I don't think that that's going to stay. Um, however, 
what is now recognized is that aerosolized pathogen beyond the six foot social distancing guidelines uh, is a real risk of infection that needs to be appropriately addressed in uh, buildings to reduce the risk of infection. All right, and the next question, I'm sure we've all asked ourselves this before. How is it that we have never discussed this or researched this prior to COVID to understand how all of this affects airborne transmission, especially when we historically have more deaths per year due to the flu? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, I, 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 I could only hazard a guess. Uh, I, I just think we've culturally learned to live with it. We have cold and flu season, so um, we just deal with it. We worked through it. <laughs> we just worked through it and we dealt with it. But what I was surprised in doing the research during the pandemic and building the presentations, uh, what really, really surprised me was really what is the indoor air quality of a space? And it, 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 it demonstrated itself that is no accident why we have cold and flu season at the time of year that we do. And I think it's directly related to the indoor air quality within the built environment where we spend 90% of our lives. And uh, the, I, I, I hope today I covered some of the factors that will allow us to uh, more effectively uh, deal with the challenge to reduce the risk of flu and cold in a building. Um, uh, but uh, really the pandemic uh, brought to our attention what we were just willing to live with in the past. And that's an excellent point. Um, the, um, uh, the impact of the flu and uh, the risk of infection and potential for death has always been significant in the past. And I don't remember the numbers, uh, though COVID-19 resulted in more fatal uh, outcomes than uh, flu, uh, something by like 2%, I think it was less than 0.5 of one, or no, point, I think it was less than 0.1% of people who came down with flu actually died were in COVID during its height. It was in the realm of two to 3%, uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly. So obviously we've cr we crossed the threshold of, uh, of alarm in those percentage levels. And certainly our healthcare facilities went through a terrible time in dealing with the hospitalizations during the pandemic and trying to keep up and maintain the care that they uh, were meant to do, so. All right, we have a few more questions. Um, so I'm still coming in. And so um, feel free if you do have to jump off, obviously go for it. Um, but if you do wanna stick around and ask more questions, we'll be here. Um, so would it make more sense to use a single pass system when designing the air system versus high induction diffusers? Uh, depending on your goal, uh, if your goal is to maintain better indoor air quality, I would say yes, because in 100% outside air systems, air is continually exhausted from a building. Uh, there's no return air path in passive systems like passive radiant cooling and heating systems. Uh, and if you used underfloor outside air systems, that contaminated uh, warm air in the upper levels of the room are exhausted from the building. So it uh, is a very effective way of, re of, of removing and depend of removing contaminants and pathogens from the building. And we can uh, increase or decrease the effectiveness depending on what levels of outside air we assign to the rooms. And it doesn't need to be blanket for a room. Uh, ASHRAE is moving in the direction of two to three air changes per hour in a building in order to maintain a healthy environment. There are also read articles that say it should be more in the range of four to six air changes per hour. Well, if you could do, um, uh, uh, make sure that that air is 100% outside air at two to three air changes per hour, then uh, you're always continually flushing your building. Now there's an energy penalty to that in conditioning your outside air, uh, that volume of outside air. So, um, um, anyway, I hope that answers the question. All right, and then th this was, I think, about a specific slide. It says, how can you discharge 150 feet per minute at the diffuser when ASHRAE calls for 150 feet per minute at four and a half feet from the floor in the unoccupied zone? 
the ASHRAE standard 55 calls out for 50 feet per minute of velocity at the occupied zone, uh, not 150, uh, if I understand your question correctly. Uh, you design your HVAC system so you have a, a flow of air at a velocity of 50 feet per minute at five feet above the flow, floor. Uh, and that's what standard 55 outlines. So you're absolutely right. You see a reduction of, of uh, velocity as the air moves further away from the diffuser. Um, but uh, uh, again, to maintain thermal comfort and to eliminate drafts, you design to 50 feet per minute. Um, Chris, if I misunderstood your question, um, you can add to it in the chat. Um, Mo in the chat said, in ASHRAE um, 23 Winter Conference, there was some discussion that research shows that human tolerance to CO2 concentration changes. People wearing masks have long time higher exposure tolerance. Does this mean using 1,000 parts per million indoor CO2 concentration may not be the best set point? Uh, that is an excellent question uh, because I sat in ASHRAE's um, Environmental Health Committee session during AHR 2023, and that question came up. CO2 concentrations within a mask are in the realm, if I remember correctly, like 20 to 30,000 parts per million. So if you're wearing a mask, just a regular conventional mask, the local CO2 concentrations that you're breathing in are very high, certainly compared to uh, uh, people who are not wearing masks. Uh, again, it's a question of what is a person's comfort zone. I mean, but noted, you're, you're absolutely right. CO2 concentrations are very high to people wearing masks, and but it could have, it could impact one's um, awareness, attention span, could make us more groggy at those levels wearing a mask. Uh, that could be phenomena associated with mask wearing. All right, we feel. Uh, we field questions regarding the possible reduction of outside air when utilizing ionization air treatment. This does not address space humidity or CO2 buildup or in-space dilution of virus particles within the space and relies entirely on adequate air cycling through the system. Have you seen anything on reduction of outside air with the presence of ionization treatment? Well, <clears throat> ionization offered the promise for a reduction of outside air prior to the pandemic. Um, because it was uh, certainly the city of Phoenix acknowledged that if you used ionization, you could actually use the indoor air, uh, per, or, I'm sorry, the IAQ procedure for standard 62.1 for calculating your outside air minimum levels versus the ventilation rate procedure, which has higher levels associated with it. However, since the pandemic, I must confess, I would I would personally be challenged for reducing outside air to those levels, even if ionization is applied. Because there are certain things you need to keep in mind when you're designing with ionization. One is the average lifespan of an ion is 60 seconds. So you want to make sure that any ion generator is supplied as close to the zone as possible that you're trying to maintain. And you need to make sure that those ions are properly distributed within the space. Uh, uh, that they're supplying? Do we have sufficient, sufficient discharge velocity at the diffusers in the VAV system at part load? Well, it begs that question or whatever. So my, my, since pandemic, even using ionization, I don't know that I'd be inclined to reduce the outside air levels in accordance to the IEQ procedure outlined by 62.1 and adopted by the city of Phoenix. I would have a tendency to go with what ASHRAE's epidemic task force recommends, the minimum uh, uh, outside air rates per the standard. And, and, and for me, that would be the ventilation rate procedure value versus the IEQ procedure. But I'm confident that's a very debatable point. So speaking of 62.1, I believe this is um... A clarification on Chris's question earlier. 62.1 standard discusses the addition of more ventilation air if you do not have 150 feet per minute in the unoccupied zone, and if your discharge temperature is more than 15 degrees delta to the ambient room. Can you repeat that, Kelly, once more? And so standard 62.1 discusses right. the addition 
of more ventilation. Oh, Chris, do you want to jump in? I don't know if that was me coming off mute. Okay, so the 62.1 standard discusses the addition of more ventilation air if you do not have 150 feet per minute in the unoccupied zone and your discharge air temperature is more than 15 degrees delta to the ambient room temperature. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that's yeah, what the standard says. Um, and but but ASHRAE refers to that defines in the standard 62.1 as ventilation air comprised of conditioned filtered return air uh, and outside air. Um, consequently, <clears throat> when you're at low flow, if you're just looking at ventilation air, we have to ask whether or not we're getting the adequate minimum outside air to each of those zones. So um, I, I don't know, that's just an open question that I have. All right. Well. That is all the questions in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to add any more or come off mute, you're more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, we can wrap this up. Dan, you have any final words of wisdom? Uh, no, thank you very much for your time and joining us. Uh, the next session will be on the fundamentals of HVAC systems. And the reason why I'm going to the bare bones of the fundamentals so when we look at high performance HVAC solutions, we have a deeper understanding of how these systems work, that there really is no magic black box to them that would warrant some of the design concerns that we're perhaps faced with. So um, um, we're going to go right to the basics in the next two to three sessions so that when we move into uh, uh, more high performance building solutions, we'll understand how these systems work. Uh, uh, the way they do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you to everybody that joined us. If you requested a PDH or AIA, I will be following up with that along with the recording of this. Thank you.